all of these in order. It probably would be helpful if you say your name before you speak, just for the members of the public, since we're doing things a little differently this evening. Next on the agenda, item 1.03 is approval or revision of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for this evening? Thank you, Kelly. Second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next on the agenda, item 1.04, public comment. Sarah, do we have anyone for public comment this evening? No, we do not. She's not yet arrived. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, item 1.05, public hearing, proposed 2021-22 budget. Proposed 2021-22 start budget. Proposed 2021 Do we have anyone for the public hearing? We do not. Any board member comments for the public hearing? Mr. Furlong, you have your presentation for us? We do. Is there a motion to open the public hearing for the budget? Thank you, Dan, and a second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? Good evening, and welcome to the required annual budget hearing that is uh, mandated to be done seven to 14 days before the actual vote, which will be coming up next week. Hopefully a lot of this will look familiar to the Board of Education in terms of all the budget workshops that we've conducted since the governor released his executive budget all the way uh, to our most recent adoption. And as many of you know, I shared with you the video that Mr. Furlong and I created for those individuals in our community uh, who were unable to attend or watch a prior board meeting. Uh, and as you know, in the past, we used to do com uh, community forums at both of the public libraries. So during the pandemic, uh, the videos from last year and this year, I know have been a very important source of information for our community. Simply put, as you all know, our budget for the upcoming year is really built on the foundation of our strategic plan. Our mission and vision encompasses, and mission in particular, four key priority areas, areas that we have felt that have been the foundation of the Fayetteville Manlius School District for years past and will continue to do so for years to come. And as you know, this includes our commitment to the teaching and learning enterprise, a positive school environment, supportive community partnerships, and fiscal capacity and responsibility. And it is those areas of fiscal capacity and responsibility that you can see we've been committed to strong financial stewardship, sustainability, sound budget construction, and best business practices. And we've even been audited by the state comptroller's office in some areas that has identified our business services and being in a strong position. 
In fact, our recent ISL audit uh, validated those results, and certainly the board's audit committee will be kept apprised of both internal and external audits coming up in the months ahead. Our accomplishments for the past year, in spite of the pandemic, have been many in the areas of teaching and learning. We've worked hard to improve the remote learning environment. It certainly hasn't been optimal uh, for our students and our teachers, but as you know, the district has made a strong commitment to hiring an online learning specialist that's worked with the teachers every Wednesday for staff development. And I've been very pleased as superintendent to see the growth of the students and the teachers over the course of the last academic year. We've worked hard in the area of positive school environment in terms of mental health supports. Uh, there was an inclusion to your uh, personnel report today from Mr. Gordon indicating an expansion of our mental health supports for the upcoming year. We've added therapy dogs, not only to the high school where one existed before, but we've expanded into other buildings such as Enders uh, Road Elementary. We've worked hard in the mindfulness second step and character ed areas and our homeschool liaisons have worked to ensure connectivity between students who may feel disenfranchised, whether it's because of the pandemic or other reasons and making sure that they remain connected to school. We've also improved our safety and security infrastructure. As we all know, our construction projects have continued, whether certainly here adding cameras and other security measures uh, to the buildings and even planning ahead for door hardware in the year to come up. Under support of community partnerships, we've continued our networking and legislative advocacy, the work with our assembly and Senate representatives uh, for this district uh, has uh, been rewarded in terms of increases in foundation aid, not only for this year, but uh, projected for the next few years. We've remained connected, albeit virtually with the Tri-State Consortium and our American Association for School Administrators, Future Focus Schools Collaborative. And as you know, we've partnered with the Onondaga County Health Department to host vaccination clinics, asymptomatic testing, and testing of our athletes, student athletes uh, since uh, interscholastic athletics has resumed. And then last but not least, the fourth key priority area fiscal capacity and responsibility. Our finance committee has worked on a long range fiscal plan, which has included uh, projected capital improvement projects for the future. We've hosted a number of budget workshops. I mentioned that uh, audit regarding our RFP cycle, request for proposal cycle uh, for professional services. And thanks to the leadership of Mr. Furlong, uh, we've targeted areas such as insurance, and legal counsel, uh, as well as all other professional service areas to bring the be best, best value for the taxpayer. Uh, Mr. Furlong has also been responsible for the transparency and financial reporting as required by the state. And certainly our uh, facilities committee has provided the financial oversight of our building projects, taking a look at the contingency budgets and uh, soft costs uh, that are associated with the projects. And I'm pleased to say uh, with the current Wellwood project, we remain ahead of schedule and under budget uh, going forward. And I know the facilities committee will be taking uh, a closer look at that at their next meeting. Mr. Burlock. Thank you, Dr. Tice. So this evening, um, I know the board has seen this budget presentation several times, but there's really uh, three key points that we wanted to focus on and we thought we'd look at it a little bit different way this evening. Uh, and we figured the best way to start was with a history lesson and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And then we'll switch to a math lesson and uh, just to tease it out, you know, when does 5.8% equal 0.1% equal 0.0%. And then last but not least, uh, we'd have to have a physics lesson. <laughs> so we'll kind of hold the line on that one. So before I get to the lessons, uh, just you know, a few things I wanted to, to mention about the budget and specifically the highlights of the budget. 
you know, first and foremost, uh, the budget represents a full return to five-day in-person instruction with all the pre-pandemic activities and athletics that, that we've enjoyed here in the past. Uh, secondly, uh, there is some significant debt coming on stream, and we'll talk about, you know, what that means. Uh, and really that debt stems from recently completed projects at the high school and Enders Road Elementary, as well as the ongoing project at Wellwood. We did some, uh, see some other expenditure increases uh, in the areas of health insurance, retirement system costs, and contractual salary increases, which are not out of uh, the norm. And the resulting budget, if we look at just ongoing operations, the budget increase is 3.7%. But when coupled with the addition of the new debt, the budget increase is 5.8%. The good news, though, is the tax will be increased is 1.1%. And we can certainly estimate that the tax rate will remain unchanged, and we'll talk a little bit about how that's happening in a minute. So a history lesson, foundation aid. Foundation aid is the main operating aid that school districts across New York State receive. If we go back in time, uh, the foundation aid formula really dates back to 2007. And, you know, at the time, there was a promise that there'd be a multi-year phase in of the foundation aid to the full formula because it was a substantial increase in aid for all school districts. However, after that first year, uh, the foundation aid formula was never fully funded, uh, primarily due to the recession that occurred in 2008. And for years, uh, we've been shorted. Uh, this current year, we are shorted $5.97 million, almost $6 million short just in this year alone. Well, while that's the bad news, the good news is that the uh, legislature passed a budget that was signed into law that represents a significant increase in foundation aid for the FM school district this next year. And the even better news is, is the New York State legislature is on record to commit to fully funding the foundation aid formula over the following two years. That could be an additional $4.5 million for FM. So this first slide, this next slide is really a state aid comparison. This is a budget to budget comparison. And you can see that top line, the foundation aid line, is where we're seeing that significant increase. $1.6 million represents 16.5% increase. A couple other lines I'd like to highlight are BOCES aid, which that's an increase of almost a half million dollars. This past year, we had to buy a lot of equipment because we were in a remote learning environment. We had to buy a lot of Chromebooks. For our students, we did make those purchases through BOCES, which drives BOCES aid. So the expenditures made in this year drives state aid next year. Uh, as for the building aid, uh, you can see that building aid is up $1.6 million. We'll get to what's causing that uh, in a few more slides. And the other line I wanted to highlight was the CARES Act. This was the original stimulus package that was passed by the federal government over a year ago. And we have yet to see any of that money, but we are projecting or budgeting for that uh, funding in this next year. The overall increase of state aid is $4.2 million. That represents over a 20% increase year to year, which is significant uh, without description. It's just, uh, we've never seen that type of increase before. So for the math lesson, <clears throat> when do those three percentages equal each other? Well. First of all, the 5.8% represents the total budget increase for this year, as you saw a few slides ago. The 1.1% represents the tax levy increase. Now remember, the tax levy is the total amount collected from all taxpayers within the district. But the 0.0% represents what the tax rate is expected to increase or estimated increase. That's what actual taxpayers pay on their bill. So if their assessments haven't changed, if their exemptions haven't changed, then their tax rate will remain at 0.0%. The only outlier is those people who live in the town of Pompey, who, uh, because of their equalization rate changing, they may see a more significant increase than 0.0%. But equalization rates do not get published until August, so we don't know that yet. So, you know, usually when you have a budget increase, um, the tax will be increased is fairly close to the budget increase. 
but you can see this next year, the 5.8% is rather different than the levy going up only 1.1, and that's entirely due to the significant increase in state aid for next year. While the tax levy is going up by 1.1%, why we predict or estimate that rates will remain unchanged, it's really due to the growth in the tax base. And once again, that's a conservative estimate that we will be seeing an unchanged uh, tax rate this next year. So if we dive a little bit deeper into the tax levy limit, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, the tax levy limit is really a multi-step calculation. Uh, there's three main components that make up the tax levy limit for FM this next year. One is an inflation factor, uh, also known as CPI, and that is 1.23%. Uh, we also have a taxable growth factor, which is real new brick and mortar growth in our district, uh, which equates to a 0.54% increase. And then last but not least, there is a capital exclusion. And this is a calculation of the difference between what debt we have and what aid we're receiving on that debt. And the difference is really called the local share. And if you compare the local share with the current year to the local share next year, local share is actually going down and that's driving the capital exclusion down as well. So if you add up those three percentages, 1.23, 0.54 and minus 0.65, you'll come to our actual tax levy limit for this next year, which is 1.1%. And the proposed budget uh, is at the tax levy limit, and that resulting tax levy is $66.3 million, which is an increase of a little bit more than $700,000. One thing I did want to highlight, as people have seen in the past, that the tax levy increase, you can see for these three years, the tax levy increase range from 2.9 to 3.7 percent and yet the tax rate went down those three years um, and that kind of is indicative of when we see growth in our tax base how it drives that rate much lower than what the tax levy increases and once again as I mentioned before we're looking at an unchanged tax rate for this next year all of the revenues and there's uh, you know, quite a list here. I'll kind of skip through this slide pretty quick. There's really, this is a listing or a complete listing of all other revenue categories that we have here at FM. A uh, couple of items to, to highlight, interest income, you can see is a, a reduction in 43,000. Interest rates have fallen dramatically over the past year. The other item I wanted to list was donations or highlight. Uh, we are seeing a $327,000 uh, increase in donations. This is specific to a uh, agreement that we were able to negotiate with a solar company that is uh, putting in two solar farms within our school district. This is a one-time uh, donation and will be used to fund STEM projects throughout the district. This slide just kind of breaks down the uh, overall uh, you know, we look at a couple different ways of what makes up our total revenue. Uh, state aid of last year was actually under 23%, but with the significant increase in state aid this year, it jumped to 26. At the same time, tax levy went from 74% down to 71%. So hopefully over the next two years, if uh, the state continues or sticks with their commitment to fully fund foundation aid, we'll see the uh, percentage of tax levy continue to decline, which is good news for our taxpayers. So now we'll switch our attention to the expenditure uh, side of the budget. And as I mentioned before, you know, we had new debt and we have some uh, contractual cost increases related to salaries and benefits. But in addition, uh, it is important to note, as Dr. Tice mentioned earlier, that this, this budget does support the district's uh, strategic plan. Uh, we are expecting staffing to be relatively the same as in the current year. Uh, we have put additional resources in the budget for a wide variety of areas, but more specifically uh, related to supporting students. Uh, we are looking at uh, increasing the amount of money we spend on instructional technology since we had to purchase a lot of Chromebooks this year and iPads. We got a little bit behind in our regular uh, replacement plan and uh, the additional money this next year will help us uh, catch up. 
Uh, if we look at uh, fringe benefits alone, uh, we're seeing uh, health insurance premiums increasing by 5%. But the good news is that dental and vision premiums are remaining unchanged. Uh, we're also seeing workers' compensation premiums declining by 8%. The next two will relate to our retirement system costs. Uh, the TRS is the teacher's retirement system. We're seeing an increase in employer contribution from 9.53% to 9.8% represents a little bit less than a 3% increase. Uh, for the employee retirement system, uh, the increase is a little more significant going from 14.6% of salaries to 16.2, which represents about an 11% increase. So I know everybody was really waiting for the physics lesson, especially Dr. Tice, at that science background. So what is Newton's third law? Yeah, every yeah. Has yeah, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So what's the action? Well, the action is capital projects. Uh, the reaction is building it. So when we uh, gone out for uh, these capital projects that we're in the pro uh, process of doing, it's going to generate additional building aid revenue. And, you know, our aid ratio on building aid uh, for the FM school district is now 80%. It's been creeping up over the last few years. Uh, so it's 80%, which is good news. And really what that means is for every dollar we pay, whether it's on principal or interest related to that debt, we receive 80 cents on that dollar back in building aid. So that's, that's really good news. So the pictures here at the bottom is our, you know, some pictures of our, our great new addition at Wellwood. The art room on the left, the cafeteria in the center, and the strings room in the right. Um, and this year, we mentioned that debt expense was increasing by a little bit more than $1.8 million because of those projects. But once again, the good news, the, the reaction, is that building aid is increasing by $1.6 million. So, you know, if you look at um, what's being covered, we're, we're well over 80% of our debt, additional debt, is being covered by building aid, which is truly good news. I know typically we save the uh, employee benefit part of the expenditures for the end, but we're going to take a look at it first, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Uh, you know, you can see one line that we've highlighted is the uh, health, dental, and vision, almost an $838,000 increase, and that's really related to uh, health insurance premiums going up. The reason why we looked at this slide first is as part of the three-part budget process, or three-part budget uh, presentation, we need to allocate those expenses back to those three parts, those three parts being the instructional program, the administrative program, and the capital program. So that's why we looked at that first. If we turn our attention to the instructional program, uh, this first slide is uh, basically a listing of all of our K-12 instructional expenses. Uh, since we are a fairly labor-intensive entity, uh, it should come as no surprise that the single largest line item increase is in the area of instructional salaries. If we look at this next slide as part of the instructional program. These are more student support activities, everything from BOCES career and technical education, special education and summer school, to some of the health and guidance services that we provide for our students, athletics, the transportation to and from school, et cetera. And a couple items here that are the highest a, uh, increase uh, is really in the structural media, which was related to that IT equipment purchase that I mentioned earlier, and also in the area of uh, guidance, health services, social worker, and school psychologist. So those are uh, really a look at the instructional program increases. If you look at the percentage way at the bottom, you'll see that our percentage is down a little bit, but that's because the capital expenditure uh, percentage is up because of the new debt, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The next portion or part of the three-part budget process is the uh, expenditure part, or I'm sorry, the administrative part. Uh, here, the single largest line item is curriculum development and supervision. Uh, once again, we're putting a little bit more money in the budget to support uh, different curriculum uh, initiatives that we have within the district. And as you can see, the percentage here of um, total administration compared to the total budget is down slightly from 
9.4 to 9.3 percent. The capital part of the budget is really where we're seeing uh, an increase. Um, you know, operations and maintenance, we incurred a lot of additional expenses this year related to uh, providing uh, protective equipment and uh, hand sanitizer and uh, sanitization uh, materials. Uh, we also had reduced the budget this past year of a couple of people in that area due to retirements and we're restoring those positions. Uh, so that's really driving the operations and maintenance of budget to a large part. Uh, also, you can see on this uh, down a few lines is the capital bond anticipation notes, 1.7 million. That's part of that $1.84 million debt increase. And that's directly related to the ongoing financing of the Wellwood building project. Uh, you can see that the total capital percentage of the budget has gone from 14.4 to 16.2. So the proposed budget, uh, the total total proposed budget for this next year is $93.4 million, uh, which is an increase of a little bit more than 5.1 million. And as a percentage, it's 5.8. Transfer to capital. Um, you know, the last line, and let me go back here. The last, or one of the last lines, transfer to capital, 450,000. That relates to, uh, budgetary appropriations for limited scope uh, capital projects that we do each year. Uh, in the current year, we're doing work to repave uh, Pride Lane as we speak. And we're also looking at replacing some carpet with tile at Enders Road uh, this summer. This 450,000 that's in the 21-22 budget is really to continue and repave the remainder of Pride Lane and then uh, do a little bit of safety related work at FM High School, which makes Pride Lane eatable. In addition, we feel that we're gonna get a significant amount of carpeting, uh, carpeting replacement done at Enders Road this next year. That work does also include asbestos abatement. That work will not be done until the summer of 22. Um, but we're hopeful that if, um, if the uh, bid prices come in the same as this year, that we'll be able to almost complete the uh, carpet replacement Andrews row. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. So this kind of ties everything together. And the whole purpose of this slide is to really illustrate that of that 5.8% increase, almost 2.1 is really related to the, the increase in debt. 2.59%, uh, you know, when you add in the uh, benefits allocation, uh, almost 2.6% of the increase is really in the instructional program, which is really where we want the increases to be. So to summarize, once again, I uh, can't stress this enough. It's a, uh, the budget is based upon a full return to five day in-person instruction. We are not looking, uh, it does include funding to support the district's uh, strategic plan Currently, no plans to make any reductions to any of the programs that we offer our students. And while we do have some increases in salaries and benefits, uh, the biggest increase is really due to the new debt from the recently uh, completed or ongoing building projects. And the good news is the tax levy increase is fairly nominal, and we believe that uh, the overall tax rate will remain unchanged. And with that, I uh, want to then turn our attention to the uh, bus replacement proposition. You know, the school district will have two propositions up. One is the general fund budget, but the second one is a bus replacement proposition. And that proposition is there to uh, basically get voters to uh, vote on whether we are allowed to borrow money to then make a purchase of five replacement per uh, school buses. Uh, these are the buses that we're looking at purchasing this next year. Uh, the cost is going up a little bit. Uh, we are looking at uh, an annual cost after aid of a little bit less than $40,000 for those five school buses. Uh, we do receive about 73% on the dollar of what we spend, both principal and interest. So the state covers the vast majority of the uh, cost of, those, of that purchase. And due to the timing of the purchase, uh, 
this purchase will not have a budgetary impact until the following year. So it really doesn't impact our finances for this next year. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tice. Thank you, Mr. Furlong. And just before we open it up to any questions, it's important to remember that the budget vote will take place next Tuesday, May 18th. The polls will open at 7 a.m. and will close at 9 p.m. at Fayetteville Elementary. Uh, for that day, the teachers and students will be on remote learning, and uh, we will certainly provide additional security uh, with our school information resource officers, and we will have the staff support the vote, but the, the students and the teachers will be on remote learning. As you indi I indicated, uh, the voting hours, the polls will open in the morning and then close at nine. And absentee ballots are available on the budget and finance page of the FM website. And a thank you to our district clerk, Sarah Gridley, for all of her efforts to organize the vote in person this year and a month ahead of what it was last year in June. So if you need to call Sarah, the number is 315-692-1200. This time we'll entertain any questions that you may have or clarifications that you think the community or public would appreciate. Again, for those who missed tonight's presentation, the video is available on our website as well. Craig, just a question on the staffing. I know that we talked about the dollars are going up and that's mostly contractual increases. But in terms of numbers of teachers and teachers aid, are we up, are we down, are we consistent year over year, budget to budget? A, a lot of the teaching assistants are dependent upon uh, the individual individualized educational programs. But right now we have budgeted a continuation of employees and services going forward. But you're right, the finer detail will be as a result of the staffing needs based on a lot of those IEPs. It could be supervision as well. We've added super, uh, supervisory aids uh, for crosswalks, uh, such as during the construction from Fayel uh, through the Wellwood area and the construction zone. So we give ourselves some latitude to play with that, but it should be fairly consistent looking at a big picture. Second one. No. Okay. Um, Craig or Bill, could you just remind us of the foundation aid that we're receiving? How much of that is budgeted in next year's budget? We budgeted um, the amount that was on the state aid runs. Actually, I'm instead of going all the way back. Uh, basically, we get state aid runs once the New York State budget is passed. Uh, that information is given to us. We basically budget pretty much from that run, especially with foundation aid. So we're going to get uh, over $11 million this year. So $1.6 million increase over the current year. All right, but, well, the entire $11 million you're putting is in the budget for next yes. year. That's the one thing I want to clarify. Yes, we did put the entire amount in the budget. Yes. Other questions? Questions? Just to thank you for uh, switching it up a little and doing our little school <laughs> format today. <laughs> Don't encourage them. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Tai. Is there a motion to close the budget hearing? Thank you, Rebecca. And a second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye, you want opposed or abstain? All right, with the board's indulgence, I want to go back to item 1.04 because the person who uh, wished to have public comment is here.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Amy Caputo. Um, I'm a parent in this community. Um, I have a son who graduated last year from FM, and I have a daughter who's uh, in ninth grade and a daughter who is in eighth grade. And I see some uh, familiar faces here. Uh, thank you for giving me a moment to speak to the board. Um, I wanted to come to speak to this group this evening as I um, recently received um, the letter from Dr. Tice in regards to um, some current events as far as systematic racism and our community and our school's initiative to focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I was very happy to see that our district was taking uh, some steps to work towards harmony among all the students and the parents. Uh, it is a very important issue facing uh, our community and our nation. Um, when I was reading through this information, um, I found that I had a lot of questions that I needed clarification on. Um, I know over the last few months, as I read through, it stated that this was something that you had been talking about and going to conferences. And um, I, was, I was not privy to it, as all of us over the pandemic. It was crazy times, and this was something I had not been privy to. But now that I am, um, I really would like to at some point have some of my questions answered. And I understand it won't be in this environment, but at a future date. Um, I understand um, as a parent, I send my children to school to learn academics. Uh, I also understand that it's important and it's vital as a community that we support our children in being good citizens and caring for those around them. I also know there's a fine line when it comes to teaching morality. And I, my question, and I wouldn't necessarily say concern, but I wanted to bring it forward to the board that as a parent, I do have a lot of questions, concerns about that. Um, I have high regard for FM, um, but I also have regard for my own capabilities of teaching my children morality. And I, uh, appreciate a lot of wonderful things as I've educated myself on this DEI inclusion program and the training you went through. And I've actually just recently ordered the book, How to Be um, Anti-Racist by Kendi. And I'm doing everything in my power to educate myself about this program. Um, I'm not coming here to be critical. I'm coming here to educate myself and to learn more about it. Um, I have many questions about, I hear a lot about policy being created and it just leaves me, it's very generic. What is this policy? What exactly are, does that entail? Um, who's involved? I see that there was a board, um, uh, a, excuse me, a board policy committee. And I understand certain things have to be formulated and organized. I've been on boards in this community for years. I understand the board has a certain responsibility to create policy, but when do the parents in the community get involved in this? I, as a parent, want to be involved. I want to be aware. I don't want to be surprised with an assignment or something that comes home from my child that doesn't um, reflect what I thought FM was teaching my children. And I'm sure every parent would, would say the same thing. Um, I want to know things like what exactly, when you say you're coming up with this initiative, are there specific guidelines? Are there a checklist? Teachers are required to teach specific items. Can teachers deviate from it? Can the teachers take those policies and guidelines and interpret, interpolate it and interpret their own um, ideas of what you're saying? Um, also, I would like to know, um, excuse me, let's see. How, how, is it, how is this going to be implemented in the classroom? But most importantly, I would love transparency and involvement. As a parent, I would like to know exactly where you're going with this, what's happening. I found it very challenging going on the FM website as far as finding the details of it. I kind of had to do a lot of research. And if I could have a little bit more, if you say you're coming up with policies, as soon as we can know about it, could, you, could it be available to us so that we can review it um, and be a part of these committees? Um, I also, I, I, I'm very appreciative, like I said, of the movement and everything the school board is doing to 
um, increase the harmony among all of our students within the school. And um, like I said, I just hope that at a later date, it could be considered um, that parents can be involved in this whole process. And I thank you all for what you do for our children and your time. I know that you're taking time out of your personal lives to be on this board and to serve us. And I'm very appreciative of that and your time to be here today. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for taking the time to come. Mm -hmm. uh, before you leave, um, Ms. Caputo, so there will be information forthcoming on the website about the work that we're doing. We've discussed it at board meetings uh, recently. There's an update um, that we do on our board um, agenda under board development related to the DEI work that we're doing. And there's also information from the state. I think that may be what you are referring to, um, the curriculum audit that we've talked about. That's something that's coming from the state. And so there will be guidance from the state and that will be shared with parents. So that information will get out. Um, I wrote down your questions. Um, I think I've got them all, but we will definitely follow up with you. Thank you, and I appreciate the state. I know there's guidance from the state, but I also know like right. you know, pick pieces from it. So what are we going to implement from that and what we feel doesn't isn't pertinent to our community? So thank you. I will look at that information. All right. Thanks. Have a good night. All righty. So now we're going to go to item 1.06, Code of Conduct Availability. So the Code of Conduct for 2021-22 is available for review. The public hearing and adoption of the Code of Conduct will occur at a future meeting. Item 2.01, President's Report. So the board self-evaluation information will be sent out shortly. We should be concluding our superintendent evaluation this week and um, get that information out to the board ahead of our special board meeting on Tuesday the 18th for the purpose of reviewing or for the superintendent's year in evaluation. Just wanted to um, thank Sarah and our tech team for putting together this setup for us this evening. This is fantastic. I know Sarah, it took a lot of hours for you all to put this together. So thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Um, so we've had Teacher Appreciation Week this um, month. Just want to say another thank you to our teachers and staff for all the hard work that you guys are putting into making this year um, good for our students. We do appreciate it. It's also Mental Health Month which I think is something that it's important that we acknowledge. We do have groups in our district that are doing a lot of great work there and our guidance counselors and uh, school psychologists. I do want to acknowledge it's Mental Health Month. School Nurse Week is this month as well. So we want to show our appreciation for all the work that our school nurses have done. And lastly, it is Asian American and Pacific Islander Month as well. So um, just wanted to make sure that we are aware of those recognitions um, that are on the calendar. And that is all I have for my report today. I'll turn it over to Dr. Teich for his superintendent's report. Thank you, President Mims. I put a copy uh, of my uh, remarks in uh, board docs for you to follow along. Under in internal operations, uh, in an effort to plan ahead, we are required to host our organizational meeting on Tuesday, uh, July 6th, that's the first Tuesday of the month, unless it's a holiday, it can push to that Wednesday, or it can be established by uh, resolution on another date before July 15th. So I ask the board to think about that and to plan ahead because we will be approving the Board of Education meeting schedule at the June 14th meeting as we plan ahead for the new year. Under community relations, with my recent letter to the community regarding the governance team's work on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the Board of Regents announcement last month, we have received letters of support and letters voicing concern from the public. As always, we appreciate the feedback, but it will be important to follow the Board of Regents initiative as they roll out the policy and procedures in the weeks and months ahead. In fact, uh, for those of you that were looking at your NISBA uh, emails today, you'll note that the Board of Regents Chancellor, Dr. Lester Young Jr. and the State Ed Commissioner, Dr. Betty Rosa, issued a release today just moments before tonight's Board of Education meeting. 
as, administ as an administrative team, we will delve into that information and report back to the Board of Education, uh, but I encourage you to look at some of the hyperlinks included in that state ed release uh, just earlier uh, today. Under administration, as I mentioned before, Onondaga County provided an on-site Pfizer vaccination clinic on Tuesday, April 27th. I'm pleased to report that we had 89 students and some staff take part in the on-site clinic. I'd like to thank Dr. Ray Kilmer for his efforts to organize the event. Uh, furthermore, I welcome the opportunity to speak with Dr. Indu Gupta from the Onondaga County Health Department, who took time out of her busy schedule to visit the clinic, which was held at FM High School in the House One Gym. Under non-instructional and business operations, I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to our network manager, Mr. Josh Becker, on his recent promotion uh, to the Central uh, New York Regional Information Center at BOCES. While we will miss uh, Josh's expertise in providing daily oversight of our instructional technology network, we know that he will be staying in close contact, contact with him when he assumes his new duties at the CineRec. We wish Josh well in his uh, new endeavors. In the area of personnel, as you are aware, our annual school budget vote and board of ed elections are scheduled from seven to nine next Tuesday, or this coming Tuesday, uh, May 18th, at Fayetteville Elementary School. Accordingly, the students and teachers at Fayetteville will have a remote learning day on the day of the vote. I'd like to thank our district clerk, Ms. Sarah Gridley, for her efforts to organize the vote and uh, to training the election inspectors in advance. Uh, for an added measure of security, we will have some of our school information resource officers and special patrol officers at the polling location. Because of the pandemic, uh, we will not conduct an exit poll survey in an effort to facilitate movement in and out of the voting location. And under students, uh, congratulations to our students and our music department faculty for a wonderful high school music performance of a new world. Not only did the musical provide uh, some light in the darkness of the pandemic, but it allowed our senior students to enjoy some measure of ceremonial closure to their music careers here at FM. While I was very impressed with how quickly the effort came together, I was not surprised regarding the high level of quality of the overall performance. So well done to our team. And under the area of instruction, last but not least, I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation to our teachers and staff following Teacher Appreciation Week. While the pandemic has been very difficult for all of us to navigate, our teachers have worked very hard in managing multiple cohorts of students, both in person and virtually. So congratulations on a job well done. I was certainly honored to co-write a letter of appreciation along with Board President Marissa Joy Mims on behalf of the entire governance team as a small way to honor our teachers and all of our staff, including the nurses, uh, transportation, maintenance, buildings and grounds, instructional technology, support staff, clerical, and so forth through their dedicated efforts over the course of the past year. That ends my superintendent's report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tice. Are there questions for Dr. Tice in regards to his report? I just need to go ahead. Terry and then Dan. Um, just a quick one. You mentioned that we will not be doing the uh, voting location, um, the the poll on the way out. Um, it, is there a plan to do that in some other format? Uh, we've talked about it uh, internally. We haven't reached a conclusion yet. We're just trying to keep the flow of traffic going in and out. So it, it could be something that we could follow up on. It is important information. I always enjoy reading, and I kind of missed it last year when it was a uh, ballot. Yes. <laughs> oh, that definitely makes sense. Thank you. So mine were two, and one of them was that. I, I think there's a lot of valuable information that comes out of that, especially after this year and not having had it last year. So I certainly understand not doing it on site, but if if there's a way even as people come in to vote, if we collect their email addresses and send them the, the survey externally, I, I think I think that would be well worth the effort to gather that information. My, my other question was on community relations. Um, we said we've received letters of support, letters of voice and concern. Some of those come copy to the board, but I'm suspecting that many of them do not, and that they go directly to you or through Let's Talk. And and I guess what I'd ask is, that's all feedback that's going to be very valuable to the work that we're all collectively going to be doing, but, but we don't see that. So I, I think it would be 
beneficial to us if those could be compiled and and shared with the emails and the replies so that we have the benefit of that full package of information as we continue our work on this. Absolutely. And as you know, we've been trying to channel people to Let's Talk. I think they think it's a gimmick, but it really allows them to either put their name down or to uh, shadow themselves as a hidden customer where they still enter the information, but they're anonymous to me. And then there are some that just are anonymous comments. And as we saw with the facilities project, we're able to compile that resort, our results uh, that uh, it's a little more difficult with emails. Uh, so I try to do what I can. Some of the emails, as you know, are carbon copy to the board, so I reply all. Uh, but it would be nice to channel people to let's talk. So we tried to do that with the DEI letter that went out. But I, I totally agree. I think it would be helpful to see what the community's perceptions are. And just like the exit survey, we may want to do a survey down the road of the community like that going forward. So, so just because I know you did, you've done this in the past off of Let's Talk, Let's Talk. So if those can just be compiled and shared on some interval, that would be very helpful. Additional questions or comments for Dr. Tice? Okay. We will move on to item 2.03, committee and representative updates. All right, so I don't believe there will be one from audit. Next meeting is June 16th. Um, community relations, next meeting is May 25th. Do you have anything you want to? Okay. Uh, facilities. Met uh, April 6th. I'm sorry, May 6th. Did you have an update, Dan? Yep. Um, so we went through a very preliminary, very craft phasing plan. Um, the, the phasing of this upcoming proposed high school project is complicated to say the least because this project is touching almost the entire building which is a building at capacity so uh, there's been a little bit of change driven by the desire obviously to impact the students as little as possible um, so originally this had been talked about as a two-year three summer project um, it's looking more like a three and a half year four summer project um, because it's ultimately touching virtually almost every part of the building. So I, I did forward to each of you just a, a, a very preliminary draft and please understand it's very preliminary and a whole lot's gonna change. But just in terms of what's included generally speaking is a new technology addition, consolidating the main office suite, renovating uh, some level of renovation in, in every house to classroom. In addition, at the underpass and bridge between house one and house two so that we can finally close that in and not have students passing outside to go inside and, and creating a, a, a very collaborative space that's combination, partially cafeteria, but primarily designed as a, as a collaborative workspace open um, within the school for, for a wide range of collaborative work that would be done. Uh, a new learning support center, a new broadcast journalism center, new auxiliary gym, new photography center, uh, and major mechanical upgrades that are driving a lot of this in house one and house two, so throughout the building. So it's, it's a project that uh, is, is going to really take this building that we're in tonight to you know the next level for what our students and what our programs need within the school. So. Um, more to come on that at our June meeting. Um, they're still working through um, costing estimates, and so we're really not to that point yet. Um, so just that's that's the overview of where we're at, and it's looking still toward a November or December referendum vote um, later this year. Thank you. Any questions for Dan? Next, uh, finance is meeting on June 11th. Mark, did you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank uh, Bill and Dr. Tice and everybody else for uh, a wonderful budget. Um, I think I look forward to a successful vote next week. And, um, you know, I think uh, 
It was well done. Thank you. Policy committee met on the 4th, this meeting on the 20th. Elena, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I, well, I, well, nothing really to add outside the minutes, but um, I think it was helpful. We did go through all the 1,000 series, and, excuse me, the zero series, so that we were all on the same page with regard to changes that were recommended. And, and Sarah, I wanted to thank Sarah on behalf of the committee for compiling everything and sending that to us so we could see it in red line version and double check with our notes so that would be helpful so that when we get everything to the board, um, you know, we are all in agreement with what it is that we're recommending. We did send a few policies to legal for them to put their eyes on it and we're plugging away. And um, you know what, we're just, we're doing as much as we can during each meeting and continuing at the next meeting. So it's interesting at best and I think I know I'm learning from it. I hope everyone on the committee's been learning from it. And I just did want to thank the committee as well. I know we're not done yet this year, but you know, it is a lot of reading and um, a lot of looking at our current policies with regard to NISBA's policies and um, recommendations from our administration. So um, I thank you for all hanging in there and doing the work that's necessary. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Sherry, is there an Education Foundation update? No meeting this month. Oh, yeah. do one, do one real quick. Just that there are signs, community signs that are for sale on the Ed Foundation's website, and I believe those are for sale through the 14th of this month. Um, so for signs throughout the community recognizing the graduating class, those are all still available on their website, and it'd be great to get those orders in. Thank you. Um, I don't believe we have a legislative leave on report and student board member. Hey Lucy, do you have time for <laughs> more? <laughs> 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 Coming ago. right off the field there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I there were a few things that a couple of the students came up to me within the past few weeks. One of them, actually a very simple question. When is Pride Lane going to be done paved? Because that's tricky to get out of for school. And then also we are, now that we're moving forward into the remainder of the school year, if there's like proof of vaccination or, you know, like negative tests, are we allowed to attend sporting events? And also there's been a few, a little bit of confusion at sporting events. I know that some governor came out with a rule that we're allowed to take our masks off outside, I think socially distant. Do those rules apply for school sports or do school sports or are we supposed to wear our masks during school sports outside? And then next year, a few people have come up to me about the plans next year. If there's going to be four days in the week, five days in the week, if there's going to be a wellness break, um, and that's basically it for that. And then a graduation question. Now that graduation has been confirmed, the outdoor date with a bunch of rain dates, how is the configuration of students and parents looking? Will parents sit together? Will students sit together? Um, yeah, and that's it. All right, well, Pride Lane, what's there? Pride Lane, uh, the construction, they said it would be three to four weeks. So we're already a uh, week or so in. I mean, it's weather dependent, so the more it rains, the longer it gets pushed out. So uh, they're trying to finish as expeditiously as they can so they can for another job so hopefully within the month or less question two uh, in terms of the proof of vaccination <coughs> masks uh, to our knowledge things haven't changed for uh, the venues inside we are trying to keep track of that uh, dr uh, montgomery who's our COVID coordinator is working with our communications department and our athletic director on that uh, recently, that has opened up in terms of numbers that can attend. So we are going to accommodate those increase in numbers and it doesn't, uh, we don't have to count the student athletes themselves where we did in the past. So we are trying to stay nimble with that and adapt to the new rules that are coming out. But uh, they have treated it as an event and so masks are required as opposed to just outside socially distant. Uh, in terms of next year, five days a week is the plan. So again, a lot of that will be dependent on uh, what guidance comes out. 
uh, as the CDC makes statements and then as the New York State Department of Health adopts them, uh, that will determine a lot of what we do. So will we wear masks? We don't know. We might. Will there be mass breaks or, you know, wellness breaks? We don't know at this point. So we're hoping as, you know, herd immunity is reached and more vaccines are out there that uh, they will lessen some of the restrictions going ahead. But we are planning for five days a week. And then last but not least, in terms of graduation, Dr. Kilmer had to submit a plan to Onondaga County Health Department, which was approved. So right now people will be on the turf, uh, the graduates in front, and then family members behind, I believe it's four chairs behind. So a little unit of five together. Uh, and uh, those will all be socially distant from other units. So the five people within the circle will be from the same household or family unit, and then those will be uh, changed, you know, six feet socially distant from the other families there. But I'm sure there will be more information forthcoming from Dr. Kilmer and the counselors. Thank you. Okay, moving on now to item 3.01, approval of the minutes from the April 19th, 2021 board meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you, Daryl. And a second for Mark. Any discussion of the minutes? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.02, personnel actions. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly School District approve the following personal actions as recommended by the superintendent? Elena and a second from Daryl. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye, you are opposed or abstaining. Item 3.03, .03, approval of policies. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District approved the following revised policies in second reading, 7280, standardized testing program, and 8360, religious expression in the instructional program. Is there a motion? Thank you, Sherry. A second from Kelly. Discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.04, health and welfare services contract, Ithaca City School District. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorizes the Board President and Superintendent to sign the contract for health and welfare services provided by Ithaca City School District for the 2020-21 school year? Thank you, Dan. A second from Elena. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Item 3.05, 2020-21 calendar adjustment. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District that upon recommendation by the Superintendent of Schools, due to the remaining balance of emergency closure days, all schools be closed for students and staff on Friday, May 28th, and that for students in grades K through 8, Tuesday, June 22nd, Wednesday, June 23rd, and Thursday, June 24th, become half days of instruction. Is there a motion? Thank you, Kelly. And a second from Daryl. Discussion. Um, Dr. Tice, I noticed um, we've had discussion about including Juneteenth on the calendar, and I do understand that it falls within the Regents Review Week. Is perhaps one of the reasons why it's not included this year. But um, I personally would be I uh, think it would be a good idea to recognize that holiday this year. Um, I think it would fall right in line with the work that we're doing as far as DEI. Um, I know that it's going to be something we recognize in our calendar next year, but um, I personally would support having that as an additional holiday this year. Other thoughts from board members or comments? But it will be recognized on the... Um, Friday, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you just, Marissa, you just mentioned that it's part of Regents Review Week. Can you elaborate, Dr. Tice, can you elaborate what that means in terms of studying and instruction and that kind of thing? What would be missed or included? 
Yeah, they, we did discuss that as a possibility. As a lot of you know, in terms of the backstory, uh, when a federal holiday falls on a Saturday, it floats forward, such as July 4th. And when it falls on a Sunday, it floats back to the Monday. State holidays are similar, but with a slight twist. If it falls on a Sunday, it floats back to the Monday, which will be the case next year in 2022. June, 10th, uh, June 19th will be on a Sunday, so it will float to that Monday. When it is on a Saturday, like it is this year, it does not float. It, does, it is not observed on that Friday. It stays observed on that Saturday. That being the case, a lot of districts, there are a couple that we're aware of that are observing it on that Friday, but for the most part, a lot of districts, because it falls in the middle of Regents Week, are staying open. BOCES is staying open uh, during that time, too for the students. So it's strictly at the board's pleasure and discussion. Uh, but internally, when we talked about it as a district office team and an administrative cabinet, uh, it is in the middle of Regents Week uh, with the modified Regents uh, schedule this year because of the pandemic. Uh, June 17th is an exam on that Thursday. There are no Regents exams on that Friday. It would be a review session. Uh, the uh, world language checkpoint exams are on that Monday. We are not administering, so we will be in session uh, as a district for a full day on Monday the 21st. And then there are Regents exams on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. In fact, what this resolution does not show is that uh, the middle schools, uh, like the high school, will be remote on Wednesday and the middle school principals asked me today if they can be remote on Thursday uh, for the exam there. So we would have to provide remote instruction at the middle schools, uh, but it would still allow them to administer Regents exams on that Wednesday and Thursday. I know Mr. Catalino had a question this weekend. I responded earlier today. I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at that, but we really did try to, uh, we understand there's differing opinions uh, coming in from all different angles. And so we really tried to target something in the middle. The one thing I did try to clarify is that by contract for any of our bargaining units, we do not have to give any days back. Uh, and so I want to be crystal clear about that. We do so because we feel that's the right thing to do, because it's been a pandemic, because it's been a crazy year. But unlike some years where you've heard me say, oh, I have to call one snow day or I have to call two snow days in order to get to the 186 day uh, work year for the FMTA, I do not have to do that this year. Craig, I'm sorry, I guess I'm a little confused on the last part where you talked about the middle schools going remote on the 23rd and the 24th. Is that all the middle schools? Um, that would be both, well, I mean, Wellwood and Eagle Hill. They're already a remote day on that Wednesday. It's just K-4 is Monday through Friday, as you know. So you're right, it kind of looks, they would be in person for a full day on Monday the 21st, they would have a half day, or what the state is calling an early release day on Tuesday the 22nd, then all of our secondary buildings are remote as per our model on Wednesday. And so what the principals basically asked is if they can do their schedule on Wednesday for the Regents exam, at the middle schools, can they provide remote instruction on that Thursday like they would on a Wednesday, which would allow them to proctor staff, not have to worry about noise in the hall during Regents exams. So for our middle school students, our high school last day is Monday the 21st. And so it's Regents exams, the high schools are forgiven in terms of the compulsory attendance for those days, in terms of counting it as for state aid. The middle schools are not. So the middle schools would have a full day on the Monday, the 21st, and then they would have an emer or, uh, early release day on Tuesday, the 22nd, and then there would be remote instruction on Wednesday and Thursday while the middle schools, both Wellwood and Eagle Hill, would administer the Regents exams for that day. Okay, so then for the middle schools, so just so I'm clear then, so the, for the middle schools, the last day of in-person instruction would actually be Tuesday, the 22nd of June. Correct. 
Correct. Right. And then we're saying the next two days are going to be remote on the 24th. That's it. Correct. Correct. And the okay. rating day is the 25th that Friday. Right. Okay. Got it. Thank you. So a logistical question going along with that, it's probably, I don't know if it's in the works or anything, but if we're telling the students they don't have to be there for the quote last day of school, but they have to be remote, are they keeping their Chromebooks indefinitely? That's a great question. I mean, we have collected in the past. I mean, as you know, they kept their Chromebooks. A lot of them participated in Project SOAR. That is something we're talking about internally, whether that will be continued or some modification thereof. So they may very well, we may very well want them to keep their Chromebooks with the exception of the seniors that we would collect back. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm just, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm just confused. So, on the elementary level, we're going back to a proposal that they end half day, half day, half day, which I think it wasn't that many years ago that we closed on four half days. Um, and, and obviously, that's that's a logistical challenge for a ton of families. So. Can you just help me understand what the rationale is for those being half days versus ending a day earlier versus I just I, I read your email but I didn't I don't know where this lands us on the, the 176 and, and 184 so I'm just very confused why we're trying to land on half day half day half day uh, the teachers have asked as you as I said in my email today uh, usually progress reports for the first three quarters teachers work on the grades the week after the quarter closes. They do not have that. They're not afforded that time, so to speak, uh, during the last week of school. Things have to be wrapped up by rating day. So they, the term is pack up their classrooms, but traditionally what they're doing are closing out the books, grading, late assignments, whatever, and trying to finish up by the rating day on the 25th. So we, uh, we like last year, we have to provide food service. We have to do it this year. So I prefer the term early release day. It'll look and quack much like a half day, but the idea would be is to provide the teachers with that time in order to close out the year. You're right, it's difficult on our families, but uh, an early release day still counts towards the 176 instructional days. And we can only count up to four staff development days but as you know with the shell game this year we front end loaded all our staff development days at the beginning of the pandemic so we have to be in session either a full day or an early release day so, so that was my question so those i'm i'm sorry i'm that, sorry that, so that gets us right to 176 yes, yes. that's what i wasn't clear about okay thank you the 25th uh, as a rating day counts as well but it's by law it counts as a student attendance day even though it's a work day Can I go back to the original topic if we or the original comment if we were to give Juneteenth as a Friday, um, how would that affect those uh, early release days at the end? If they wouldn't exist. If we you mean traded for them, is that what you're saying? I think Marissa's initial comment was she yeah, would like have... to do it as, a, as an observance on a Friday. If we cho chose to do that as, a, as an observance on a Friday, then how would that affect the last week of school? Uh, it would be the second emergency closing day that we have left. We have two left. So some districts are giving Juneteenth, but they're not giving the Friday before Memorial Day. So I know based on our conversations before, we wanted the Friday uh, before Memorial Day for a four day weekend. If we were to give Juneteenth off, that would be the second emergency closing day. But we wouldn't have to do that. We wouldn't have to take away the Memorial Day Friday, right? We wouldn't have to That's take just, away the Memorial Day. I understand what you're saying, though, just yes. to be cautious because we wouldn't have any left. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely a tricky issue. Thoughts from other board members? Comments from other board members? I mean, I'm wrestling with the issues and thinking about the administrative recommendation, which I, I know there was a lot of thought put in. Um, I personally want to see Juneteenth recognized and I understand it doesn't need to be this year as it doesn't float. Um, 
I would support that over a four day weekend for Memorial Day. It's a more meaningful day. I under also understand it doesn't line up perfectly with Regents prep and a very chopped up last week of school. So not sure exactly where I, I stand, land on it, but I, I definitely support certainly for next year. And if it's if we're able to swing it this year, I would I would be in favor. Next year it is in the calendar that you already adopted. <clears throat> I'm very grateful that it's in next year's calendar. It definitely should be. Um, I wonder, and this is maybe a lot to ask, but is there any way that our administrators could do any kind of quick Juneteenth on Friday? Um, just some acknowledgement even. I don't know exactly what that would look like, but I know it's busy for everybody at the end of June. But I think yeah, there are still people who don't know what the holiday is. <coughs> I can certainly discuss it with yeah. the team. Yeah. But I, but I also, as Rebecca said, I respect what the administrators are asking us to do this year, and I, I would proceed on that. The last chief school officers meeting, there is a district just to the east of us or so that's taking it, and then there is one to the west of us uh, that was considering it. But most are staying in session to the point where the OCM BOCES is staying in session just because the schools are operational on that day. I think for me, I mean, I'm, I, again, a little bit torn on it, but I mean, it, because it's a Saturday and I know we are going to recognize it next year. And I know there are other groups that are not also not taking the day as a holiday because it falls on a Saturday, but planning going forward to follow, you know, the, the state guidelines for the for a state holiday. Um, I think in that case, I'm okay with not having that day this year for that reason, just because of where it falls. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't want that. I wouldn't hate for that to send a signal to anybody that we didn't think it was important. So I was thinking the same thing that Daryl thought of. If there's a way, and you know, maybe they're already planning. I'm sure there are some teachers that are already planning this, but to recognize the Juneteenth holiday on that Friday, I think would be great. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I absolutely think holidays are great and recognizing people and our history is important. Um, but I think as a district, we'll show our true colors by the work we do on this. So I, I would hope that just because we don't give that day, that doesn't mean that we're not invested in and involved as I think we, we have been. So I would be okay with going with the administrative recommendation on that. Um, I as well am okay with going with the administrative recommendation. Um, I'm a little leery of asking administrators to look to see if they can do something to within each building. You know, I would hope that on the website perhaps we could put something up on the web website um, showing that we are acknowledging. You know, I, because I also don't, you know, with testing taking place on the 24th from what I'm understanding or reviews, I just, I'm sure that's the part of the conversation that took place with all the administrators. And I feel confident that if they landed on the recommendation that we handle it this year, that that's really truly what's best for our kids this year. So that's why I'm leaning towards following that recommendation. I think the only thing I might ask or suggest would be a public address announcement. Nothing elaborate. Certainly not an assembly or anything, just something to acknowledge. I think my biggest concern with doing it this year, as opposed to as it is on the calendar next year, is, is our students have had just an unprecedented number of not in-person days this year. And I'm sure the teachers in those classes that are giving Regents exams already have their calendars planned out of what lessons they're going to be doing and what Regents review and test prep review they're going to be doing. And it, it just, it's one more change to their planning calendars of how they're going to fit in material that they just haven't had time to fit in this year. And it's one more hit to the students who have to take those exams to cost them that extra day of review. So I, I would be very reluctant and not in favor of changing that day for this year because of the impact that it would have on the students taking those exams. And finally, I'll add, um, you know, stepping back and looking at the 
academic year and the challenges we face. Um, I certainly do value the importance of uh, that June 18th. However, I would want to recognize the hard work of the administrators put into the thought process and their recommendation. And to echo Dan's comments, uh, with all the challenges our students have faced during the year, I think we should allow them that day to, to study for the regents and to have a, a class time. So that's my thought. Any additional comments? Uh, thoughts on the uh, Oh, sorry, Lucy. It's okay. Oh, I was just saying for the recognition of it, if we're not getting the day off, I'm sure FMTV would be willing to do something, put on the announcements and send out during um, wellness breaks. Great idea, Lucy. Thank you. All right. Is there, are there any additional comments or thoughts on the calendar? We get a motion and a second. We've had discussion. All those in favor of approving the calendar, I'm sorry, approving the action, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, moving on to item 3.06 King and King's Architects contract. Is there a motion that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District? Approve the contract amendment number 12 with King and King Architects for the 2021 capital transfer project in the amount of $36,000. Is there a motion? Dan, second from Daryl. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Uh, item 3.07 LaChase Con Construction Services contract. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District authorizes the superintendent of schools to execute the contract for pre-referendum services from the Chase Construction Services in the amount of $10,000? Is there a motion? Thank you, Kelly. Second from Dan. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and get aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next, item 4.01, Board Development. So as Dr. Tice mentioned there, we do have an email that we received with an update from the Board of Regents. There's a lot of guidance in there. Um, if everyone could take a uh, moment to make sure you read through that um, because it talks about policy, it talks about um, how their recommendations are going to affect every aspect of, of um, school. So please make sure you do read that email and I think we'll have a discussion, better to have a discussion about that after everyone's had a chance to look at that guidance but it should be, it came right before the meeting started. Uh, working agenda items, none. Potential considerations for future meetings. Uh, future meetings calendar. So our next meeting is on May 18th. That's a special meeting. So that we're going to go immediately into executive session for the purpose of the superintendent's year-end evaluation. There is one correction there. The annual special services report will be June 14th, not oh, May yes. 18th. There may be some personnel on May 18th, but their the special services report will be the 14th. The last one? <laughs> That'll be a very special day. Sad day. We don't return the security deposit until we get that last report. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Okay. Uh, to remember. Okay. Consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Thank you, Mark. And a second from Rebecca. All those in favor, please raise your hand, indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstain? All right. Now, executive session. So we do have two items proposed for executive session. One is the employment history of a particular individual, and the second is collective bargaining related to FMAA. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Thank you, Rebecca, and a second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? All right, so we're going to conclude our public portion of the meeting and go into executive session, and we won't have any public business afterwards. Thank you all for attending. I tell you, it's so much nicer. And the mask is driving me crazy, but it's nice to have people. <laughs>